So hello everybody. Um, so today, welcome at the Tenable webinar. We're going to talk about risk-based vulnerability management. I'm Jerko Velchen. Uh, I'm a security pre-sales engineer of, for the Belux team. Um, so let's start. So what is exactly uh, risk-based vulnerability management? This is what we're going to talk about. Um, the issue what we have uh, the last couple of years is that the, the vulnerabilities keeps are keep rising, so we get more and more vulnerabilities, which is a little bit logical because there are also more and more applications. So uh, the, the, the applications and and, and everything uh, operating systems are, are increasing enormously, uh, so we also get more vulnerabilities. Also, people uh, get into more and more research uh, to find vulnerabilities. So that's that's a very good thing for the industry. Uh, the more we find, the more we can fix, which is good for everybody. Uh, what we are going to focus on is we're going to find the vulnerabilities that we know, but that you also know which one you need to fix first, which is very important because not all vulnerabilities are, are equal. So you don't only have the vulnerabilities, but you also have the attack surface, which is expanding. So you have your corporate network. Uh, previously, which was 20 years ago, it was only uh, in the firewall perimeter. So everything was really controlled. Uh, nowadays, the attack surface where like a scan attack uh, is increased enormously. Everybody's using uh, laptops, working from home, uh, uh, especially now with COVID-19. Uh, mobile um, is, is very popular. Um, everybody uses his phone for work also. Uh, on top of that, we also have industrial OT. Uh, look at Honda. Uh, yesterday it was in the news. Uh, they were attacked by ransomware. Uh, the factories are, are just are not working anymore, which is a big issue uh, for industrial OT and ICS and Scala systems. So they can really have a really big impact uh, if you don't have a really, really good layered approach. Um, on, then we have also container security. So a lot of people are also moving to microservices, which are using containers, uh, Kubernetes, uh, things like that. Um, and they can be used either on-prem the containers, or they can also be used in the cloud. You can have all your services in the cloud of partly or a hybrid approach, uh, but you also need to be aware of all the vulnerabilities there. Uh, one of the issues with cloud, for example, is that typically uh, our network engineer, I have a network engineering background, uh, but if, if you move me to the cloud and I have to fix or set up a cloud security, it's really difficult. You, have, you really have to be specialized to do that. Uh, for example, uh, what can be misused if you don't configure it correctly, somebody could misuse, for example, on Amazon or on, on Azure service that's running on your servers virtually in the cloud. Um, and you can hop from one instance to another one if it's not configured correctly or if there's a bug in it uh, or a vulnerability. Uh, we have enterprise IoT and of course we have web applications. So uh, even all the applications on your phone, uh, most of them are API based, which is basically also a web application. Um, so we need to cover everything because if you leave a gap somewhere, an attacker can make easily um, abuse of that gap and get into the company. So traditional legacy vulnerability management uh, can't keep up. It's based on CVSS. We'll cover that a little bit later. Um, but we have limited visibility. Uh, why? Because we can't cover everything. Uh, it, it, it's not cloud connected. For example, if, if you have the NASA scanner professional, uh, which is a very good pen testing uh, part of the pen testing tool set, uh, but it's not a vulnerability management system. And definitely not a risk-based vulnerability management system. Uh, you, it's, it's more difficult to, 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 to discover containers, cloud security, and uh, things like that. Um, 
And then we have ineffective prioritization. So if you find vulnerabilities, which one do you need to patch first? It's very important for that. And then we need to communicate also what we found. You need to communicate it to different teams. You need to communicate it to, to, to management. Um, you, what time do you spend on patching? Um, uh, which teams, uh, which, which vulnerabilities does a certain team uh, need to do and things like that. So communication is also very important in vulnerability management. You can find vulnerabilities, but you also need to patch them. Uh, so we are focused on risk-based vulnerability management. So the legacy tools can't handle the modern attack surface because limited visibility, ineffective prioritization and poor communication. So CVSS, uh, traditional vulnerability management is based on CVSS. Uh, the issue with CVSS is that a score is being assigned to a vulnerability. Once it's discovered, it takes a little bit of time. Um, scoring is based on if um, the vulnerability, um, if, if there's remote, if there's code execution possible. Uh, so code execution means um, you get some way of, of executing an executable uh, or a PE, uh, portable executable, uh, that you can do something on a system. This can either be local, so you need to be already have access on a system, and then you can have local privilege ex escalation, for example, by remote code, ex uh, by code execution, or you can do it remotely. For example, a typical one, uh, a very known one, um, is um, the one that uh, the ransomware makes use of the SMB vulnerability, Eternal Blue, that's remote code execution. Why? Because somebody uh, remotely could just connect to a system, um, execute the exploit, and he would have access um, with system account on a Windows system, which is very dangerous because then they're in. So that's, a, that's an issue with CVSS, is that it only takes that into account at the moment the vulnerability is discovered. So let's say we have a vulnerability that's not remotely code, uh, doesn't have a remote code execution uh, from the start, or there's no proof of concept. It's a theoretical vulnerability, which also exists. So it's not an issue at, at first sight. Um, but at a later phase, let's say half a year later, somebody is really researching the vulnerability and he makes a proof of concept available. Like this is how you can make use or get code execution with this vulnerability. Then the CVSS basically stays the same. Uh, another example is if you need to click something, the CVSS score, if you, need, if you have an office vulnerability uh, and the user needs to click on something, the CVSS scoring will never be above 7.8 or never above 8, so it will never be a critical one. However, a lot of vulnerabilities in Office, even if the user there's user interaction and, and they get a pop-up and they need to click some, somewhere on, are being used in exploit kits or phishing attacks. So that severity should be much higher because attackers are really using that vulnerability. So that's an issue, uh, and, and we have an answer for that. So another one um, with CVSS is that 56% of all vulnerabilities are basically 7 plus, so it's high or critical. Uh, the other one are lower, but it doesn't give the right, so it's a lot uh, information. So in the first slide, uh, one of the first slides you saw there were like, uh, let's go back. So this year, so 2019, there were 17,300 vulnerabilities. If you fix, if you have to fix more than half, that's that's really a lot. Um, and you don't know where to focus, so you become overwhelmed, uh, which is not the intention because. You need to focus on what you need to uh, fix first. Another example of CVSS, it's not that good, is here you can see uh, which one are exploitable and which one doesn't have an exploit. So if you see everything above seven 
to 10. Um, you see about, if you click out, it's about uh, 15,000 more or less um, that have an exploit. And all the other ones don't have an exploit available. So it's a vulnerability, but you can't misuse it. And maybe it's, 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 it's gives a system, it's, it's not uh, stable for the system. If nobody could get code execution on your system, which you can basically do uh, on a monthly patching cycle. But the ones that you need to fix first is the one that are exploited. That's where an exploit is available. Another issue is if you look at the 4, for example, to 4.9 and 5 to 5.9, 6 to 6.9, 4 to 7, basically. You see that a lot of ones are also having a, an exploit code available. So if you have your prioritization based on CVSS and you fix everything that's high or critical, so seven and above, you leave a lot of vulnerabilities open to be exploited because a lot of ones uh, between four and seven are also exploitable and are being used in exploit kits, for example. So you need to focus also on that. So that's where, um, so that's a big fundamental problem. Um, and, and you have a lot of data and you don't know where to start. Uh, and you could be focusing on the wrong vulnerabilities or the wrong issues that you're having, uh, leaving your company open to other vulnerabilities that are really important. So that's why we introduced risk-based vulnerability management. So what are we solving with that? So we're going to do an assessment of the traditional and modern assets, so we can assess your internal IT infrastructure. Uh, we can discover, so basically we're going to first discover and see what you have. Uh, but you can also have connectors with Azure, Amazon, Google Cloud, uh, so you can also see your uh, modern assets. Uh, or with a NASA scanner, uh, you can also see which container are active or which images you are using. Um, you can deny a pool if an image from a container has a certain CVSS, seven and above that nobody is able to use it. Uh, the developer needs to update the libraries and once everything is um, good, uh, everybody can make use of that image and, and run it in containers. Same for web applications. The vulnerability severity. Uh, so it, it's, it's dynamic, it's not a static score like CVSS. So if a proof of concept or it's being used in an exploit kit, we want to know that. Um, and it, it needs to change also. Uh, and then threat and exp exploit intelligence. So uh, also, again, if an exploit is available, uh, but you also want to take into account threat intelligence. Uh, of course, everybody can build their own threat intelligence platform, um, but we take in to about, um, I think it's nine big, uh, threat information flows, which take into account more than 150 um, in total uh, threat, threat source, sources. Um, another thing which is also really, really important is that if you have an exploit on a laptop, a vulnerability on a laptop, this can be critical. Uh, however, if you have a vulnerability active, on your web server facing the internet, which is remotely ex uh, exploitable, then that should be fixed first. So your web server in the DMZ, the criticality of that asset is a lot higher than just a company laptop that somebody is using. Uh, so that, that's also a, a correlation between that. So that's what we need to identify. And that's where we're going to help with risk-based vulnerability management. So what are the differences? Again, so vulnerability data only for legacy uh, vulnerability management. Well, with risk-based, we're going to have correlated data, the threat intelligence and asset criticality. So it's, it's, it's also, leg legacy is also just focused on, on, on internal assets, uh, which are in the company uh, IT focus. Um, but we also need to expand that 
to OT, for example, operational technology, uh, like Honda, for is a, is a good point. Uh, container security and application security. We also, of course, don't want a point in time visibility. If you do, for example, with the NASA scanner, you do every six months, you scan the environment. You have a gap of six months because vulnerabilities are changing all the time. Uh, there can be uh, an application and, and after a week that you scanned, a vulnerability can be discovered, a CVSS is assigned, uh, a CVE is assigned. You need to be aware of that, so it needs to be dynamic and you have to have continuous visibility. Uh, so it's, it's more of a reactive approach, while risk-based VM is a more of a proactive approach. And then, you, of course, you need to have your uh, policies and, and, and your strategic decision support needs to be also uh, correct. So we have to solve the CVSS problem. We made VPR, which is Vulnerability Priority Rating. It's basically the same as CVSS scoring. It's between zero and nine. But that big difference, that it's really dynamic. Um, we have data sciences that, that does machine learning on it. We have the threat intelligence sources that we take into account. And then we get a vulnerability rating. Um, and what that does is, this is a marketing slide. It, it, it says it gives you a reduction of 97% of vulnerabilities that you uh, have to focus on. In reality, it will be a little bit less. Uh, but we give a big reduction uh, on the vulnerabilities where you have to, which you have to remediate um, and which will have a big impact uh, on, on the safety of your systems. So what do we do with VPR? So we take, it's like, uh, we analyze all uh, the vulnerabilities um, and like you see here, it's analyzed for prediction and on the first uh, topic, like uh, more than 20 million. Uh, so we also, with VPR, we're also going to predict if a certain vulnerability will be exploitable or if proof of concept will be available within a certain time, which is more or less like now it's defined for 28 days. Uh, we have some very good Examples for this. Uh, one example is Elasticsearch, where there was a vulnerability discovered. Um, the CVSS was like 7.x. Uh, and we, one week or two weeks before the proof of concept was available, we raised the VPR scoring to 9.8 or something. Um, so everybody could be could patch the Elastic. Um, before the proof of concept was available and before an exploit was really available. So it's about 10 threat providers that we take into account and about 9,000 distinct threat sources. Um, and, and, and we track about 55K of vulnerabilities every night and we recalculate uh, the scoring every night. So we talked about VPR, which is a CVSS alternative. Uh, and then we also have asset criticality. So with asset criticality, what we're going to have is um, how critical is an asset? If it's a firewall, if it's internet facing, does it have a web server on it? Uh, it's a SQL server. Does it have containers actively running? Uh, so the, all these things are really important. And together, uh, these two combined give you um, a cyber exposure score of an asset and for the total company. So, how does risk-based scoring work? So based on CVSS, you have a lot of criticals, you have a lot of highs. And if you go to cyber exposure score, um, together with ACR and VPR together, you only have a really, just a tip of the iceberg, which is critical for you for, in your environment. Um, and then uh, only a couple of ones that are high. And the one that are medium and low, you can just do them on a, on a normal patching cycle. So how do we work? So Tenable, it's um, Nessus based. So Nessus is around for a long time. Um, and the good thing is we have uh, a couple of platforms. They're all based on the same scanning engine, whatever you use. 
so we can do active scanning with the Nessus scanner. We can also install agents. So the agent is a, a small software. It's going to make an inventory of your installed software. If we know the versions, we know which vulnerabilities are available. Um, and the agent scanning is very popular now with COVID-19. A lot of people are working remote. It's very hard to scan laptops um, through a VPN. So a lot of our customers were deploying um, agents to, to still have a, a good visibility on, on what the laptops, uh, the, the, what software need to be updated immediately. Uh, my wife, she worked for a big bank in Belgium, and then and she were also has to work from home. Uh, and she basically, I think once a week, she needs to let her laptop uh, be on in the evening uh, and connected to the VPN, and then they do the software updating. And then in the evening, when, when we go to sleep, we see that the BitLocker screen is on, so uh, she has to log in again. Uh, but the system is patched which makes me happy that the bank is quite secure and, and does the cyber hygiene uh, quite good. Um, so here again, we have image assessment, web application, uh, and basically we connect to everything. So with Tenable, we try to focus uh, on a couple of key questions. So where are we exposed? Uh, this is very important um, that you know everything. Uh, there are a lot of stories going around that, 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 that companies say we are really secure, we invested in identity management, we invested in, in, in a, a next-gen antivirus, next-gen firewall, everything. You do a pen test and, and basically there's a proof of concept from four years ago, everybody forgot it. Uh, never patched, um, everybody that was involved in the proof of concept was out of the company, so nobody shut it down, connected to the internet. Um, so if a system is has not been patched for four years, so the pen test is basically did a scan of what our public facing web service were. It was one with really old software and it took them two minutes uh, and, and, and the IIS server had a relationship with the AD, a trust relationship with the AD, and basically within three months they had admin access on the Active Directory. So you need to know all your assets and what they are having. Once we know what we have, we can scan them and we can prioritize based on risk. So what's the ACR and then what's the VPR and then how important is that asset for us? Um, and then for more from management and, and, and internal uh, reporting, you also need to know how are you doing over time? How are we doing better? How are we getting worse? Um, do we have more assets? Uh, do we need, need more people uh, in, in this project to, to do the patching and, and to manage the systems? And then, of course, how do we compare to peers, not only internally, uh, how are the different teams uh, doing, for example, the Linux team and the Windows team or cloud and on-prem, uh, but how is everybody else doing concerning vulnerability management? And how do we compare to, for example, if you are a bank, how are other banks um, doing their risk scoring? So this is an overview of, of what we offer. Uh, so basically, Tenable SC is our on-prem managed platform. Uh, very important. It's, it's still really actively defined, um, developed. We had a product management call yesterday. Uh, globally, uh, you are releasing a lot of new stuff uh, by, by the end of this year. Um, and then we have Tenable IO, which is our cloud managed vulnerability, ma uh, risk based vulnerability management product. Um, on top of that, which crosses Tenable SC and Tenable IO, we have Lumen, which is a diff, uh, it's, it's a separate product which will make you able to do the calculation of your um, what's your cyber exposure score so which for the what's your cyber hygiene uh, in the company are you scoring very good or very bad in the company and this is a separate topic it's a very interesting product um, if you have for example vulnerabilities a lot of vulnerabilities on a, on a system that's important for you but you have, this is something that we are releasing in the future. Uh, for example, you have a lot of compensated controls like IDS or IP, IPS signatures. Um, we take that into account also. So it's just not the vulnerabilities only that we take into account to give you a score of how good or how bad you're doing. We also take 
other things into account. How you're scanning, are you doing credential scans, or just doing outside scans, or doing agent scans, yes or no. And Tenable SC and Tenable IO, and Lumen also, is being fed by scanners. So we have the default Nessus scanner, we also have passive uh, monitoring with the Nessus network monitor, we have agents that are typically used in a VPN environment, or for example, if you need to scan to a firewall, uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult to do that, then you can install agents on the servers, which makes everything easy. We have industrial security with Indigy, uh, a company that we bought um, the end of last year, which has a very unique uh, technology of, uh, of of getting information from PLCs. Uh, container security, so you can integrate it in your DevOps uh, uh, environment, either with Azure or on-prem with Jenkins, whatever you want. Uh, and web application scanning, so if, for example, a developer, they can make sure that they just do a scan of a web application before they go into production. Um, and on the left and on the right, you see Tenable ecosystems uh, and third party systems. So we have very extensive APIs. You have a couple of um, uh, key partners that we work together on. One is also uh, attending this uh, expo, which is uh, Splunk. It's one of our key integration partners. On top of that, so we have all the risk, you know what to focus on. Um, what we all serve is remediation guidance, which we just don't tell you this is your issue, but we also tell you this is how you fix it. For example, after Patch Tuesday, you need to install a certain KB from uh, Microsoft, or you need to install it, and you also need some registry keys that you need to change. And we can make dashboarding based on, uh, for example, somebody forgot to reboot a server after they patched it. Uh, so there's a special uh, key for that. Uh, that the server need to be rebooted, uh, so we can we can track that, and uh, we give you workflow guidance. The same for web application security. If we find a SQL injection uh, vulnerability um, or a cross-site scripting vulnerability, you will get some guidance on how to fix it. We have some links in there uh, which which can help you uh, how to fix it. So, what do we say about vulnerability? management or risk-based vulnerability management. Uh, of course, every vendor says they're the best, so you don't have to take our word for it. Uh, so Forrester released a report for that. And as you can see, we're on the top right uh, corner uh, together with Rapid7 and Qualys, uh, but we are very right and, and on top of the leader of the Forrester Rave report. So Gardner, the same, uh, basically traditional vulnerability management is, is, is coming to an end. We see a lot more companies going to risk-based vulnerability management. And you, you, if you're not using basically rich risk-based vulnerability management or, or better approach to, to vulnerability management, what they say, they will be breached. Uh, so that's an issue. Uh, really important with vulnerability management is we provide guidance on that, uh, but you have to have procedures in place uh, and, and policies in place that, that everything is also be, being patched in the correct way and, and in, a, in a timely manner. Um, so what they also say that uh, if you have risk-based vulnerability management, um, so they have, that companies will have fewer breaches. So. Uh, it's not only us, of course, you need to have a layered approach uh, and best practices uh, in security in general. So to summarize, uh, risk-based VM, what will enable that for you? Uh, so address your entire attack surface. So be able to see everything in the company. So if it's OT, if it's cloud, if it's web application, you need to have a full visibility. Um, like I said, a lot of companies are being just breached by things they forget or don't know that they had it anymore. Um, then understand vulnerabilities in the context of risk. 
So not just the vulnerability on its own. It doesn't say a lot. Uh, but if you have context, if you know it's on a system and the vulnerability, uh, which is important for you, uh, you keep saying, for example, the web application, it's internet facing, um, and it's, 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 it's important for your company. Uh, and, the, and the vulnerability is remotely exploitable. You need that is a high risk vulnerability on that system. If you have an office exploit, which is nobody can misuse it and it just basically uh, at a certain time just crashes word. It's an issue, but it's not a security issue. It's more of a yeah, user experience issue. Uh, so you have to stop wasting time vulnerabilities that don't pose a risk. So that's uh, if, if it's what I just said, if, if you have an office exploit, which is basically uh, yeah, a stability issue and, and not an exploit issue. Um, and then reduce the greatest amount of business risk with the least amount of effort. So uh, be able to focus uh, with, with, with all the data that we have uh, and then don't focus on, on stuff that doesn't matter. So I'm at the end of my slides. Uh, I hope it was useful. Um, I didn't talk about 45 minutes, but if you have any questions, please come to our stand and talk to us. Our team is available. Uh, a lot of people are also in this call uh, from our team. Uh, and we will be happy uh, to help you. We can have trials of every product we have. So uh, we have Tenable SC as a trial. We have Tenable IO, which you can uh, have a trial or activate it yourself uh, on the website. For OT, uh, we have some very good OT specialists in the UK. So basically, we first have a call with you with, with that specialists um, and then we can go further in the process making your OT environment uh, also a lot safer uh, and, and hope that something like Honda doesn't happen to you. So that's it. Thank you and uh, hopefully see you at the booth.